So as made evident by my enthusiastic contributions earlier in this episode, I was pretty pumped when this episode got scheduled because as you know, I lived in Rochester, New York from about 2005 to 2007. Mm -hmm. And while there, I took classes at Monroe Community College. I was in Monroe County with the granddaughter of a victim and kind of a perpetrator in my case. Oh. A man named Jimmy the Hammer Massaro. We'll get to him. Okay. That is only one of my claims to Rochester fame, alongside the fact that I got 86 from Vinyl Nightclub for fighting with the bouncer and then demanding a hot dog. (laughs) <laughs> survived 2 a.m. visits to the infamous street meat food truck which i am pretty sure got shut down uh-huh flirted with the bikers at dinosaur barbecue and my astonishing ability to take down an entire garbage plate at 18 years old before i suffered from car- chronic reflux that's why you're now suffer still suffering from chronic reflux probably but like i wasn't <laughs> in rochester for long But Mm -hmm. I fucking did it when I was there. You sent it. I sent it. I laid it down. I flipped it and I reversed it. Mm -hmm. And you lived in a gorgeous home. Yeah, it was beautiful. My days in the city that always sleeps were few, but they were foundational. Rochester, though sleepy and unassuming in the aftermath of Kodak's fall from grace, the one industry that drew so many to live and work in the community that faced massive layoffs with the coming of the digital age. It was once a hub for mob activity, which if you've ever spent five minutes talking to someone from the Chester should not be surprising, but what's the Chester Rochester, the Chester. Oh, okay. But let's just break down that history. Shall we? So first we're going to start with the Rochester crime family, AKA La Cosa Nostra. This was a subsection of the Italian-American mob based in Rochester, New York, made up mostly of Italian immigrants. Their core operating years were between the 1950s and 1993, which their, the reign kind of ended with the death of boss Samuel Red Rosati, and he was named Red because he was a redhead as a child. Oh, I thought it's because he killed a lot of people. Nope. Mm. The names are way cuter in origin, most of the think. time that like they're more <laughs> precious in origin than their behavior would indicate, which is always wild to me with the mafia names, but whatever. Okay. So La Cosa Nostra became an independent family following an internal power struggle in nearby Buffalo, New York, that had caused a split around the 1950s. So there had been one kind of greater upstate New York area mob family that had leadership in buffalo but they had like people in rochester and then rochester broke off it was like no 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 we're doing our own thing now okay frank valenti was rochester's first official godfather nicknamed the sphinx due to his stone cold emotionless facial expressions when interrogated by police (laughs) god la cosa nostra ran the organized crime in rochester including gambling some by their terminology prostitution and extortion a lot of extortion so in the frank the sphinx valenti area era he was a flashy leader he was a super flashy individual he was always dressed to the nines in the most expensive suits he wore gold watches slicked back hair sloppy steaks he used to be a real piece of shit so this is like in the 60s yes earlier okay yep Valenti would bribe law enforcement and assassinate problems as they arose. When a series of police raids took down many of his gambling operations, he would order the murder of Dominic Aloko, whom he suspected was acting as an informant. So he was just ruthless. He was like, I think this guy's snitching. He's fucking out. Jury's still out on whether or not that guy even was an informant. They just took him out. Better safe than sorry. Truly. As gambling was the main form of income, they wanted to prevent it prevent it from being shut down unlike other mob factions valenti did not want the mob to edge into the sex work and prostitution business because quote he always believed you shouldn't make a living off of a woman what a gentleman yep so to preserve his morally superior line of income and prevent further interference with the gambling ring he held a meeting with members of the vice control unit of the rochester police bureau A later investigation concluded this meeting was, quote, certainly not for any legitimate law enforcement purpose or for the carrying out of any lawful and proper police function, end quote. (laughs) 
but rather to hand out bribes so the cops would look the other way. He was suspected of the murder of Johnny Broadway Cavagro- Cavagrodi, a Russo loyalist, and Russo was a Buffalo, a Buffalo, New York mob leader whose weak leadership allowed for like the splintering off slash creation of the Rochester branch. Okay. Who failed to fall in line when Valenti took control in the Chester. Mm. In 1968, with Buffalo's aging leadership in jail, Valenti officially declared Rochester as an independent family that would no longer answer to Buffalo. He made Samuel Red Rosati as his underboss, made veteran mobster Rene Picaretto as his official advisor, and appointed others, including Salvatore Sammy D. Gingello, Dominic Celestino, Thomas Didio, Angelo Va- Va- uh, Angelo Vaccaro, and Dominic Chiquiro, uh, Chirico, God, these names are so hard for me, who oversaw day-to-day operations on the streets. Um, it- so, question. Yes. How far away is Buffalo from Rochester? Like an hour-ish. Oh, okay. It's not that far. How long would it take you to walk? <laughs> oh, my God. Let's look. <laughs> Okay, so by car, it's an hour and 14 minutes. It would take you one day to walk. Okay. Um, It would take you one hour and 15 minutes to hitchhike or lift. Eight hours to bike. It would take you one more minute to hitchhike or get a lift than it would to just drive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I like how they've calculated that. Yep. Okay, so they're pretty close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can see why... Chains might be rattled with the splintering. Yep. Buffalo is really close to Niagara Falls, too. I'd like to go there. It's really fun. We should totally go there. We should do a Niagara Falls show. What is it? But the New York side, the trashy side. Versus? The Canadian side, which is beautiful. Oh, okay. It's also a little trashy because it's like a tourist destination but the views on the canadian side are much more beautiful than the new york side you get like the full horseshoe falls i imagine it like the wisconsin dells they have casinos and there's a madame tussauds and at least there was when i was going up there to get drunk in canada when i was like 18 okay but yeah so yeah like wisconsin dells Mm -hmm. okay so in 1970 salvatore gangello collected over a hundred grand for gambling for a gambling junket, but the money vanished. Gangello and Rusotti blamed a loan shark named Billy Lupo. And then Billy's body was found slumped over the wheel of his car, fully dead on a dead end street. Oh, double dead. As it turned out, Lupo was under federal investigation for loan sharking. So his death turned the feds attention to the Rochester crime family Mm. to draw attention away. Valenti ordered a series of bombings at various locations throughout the city using like white supremacy as his roadmap because he targeted black churches and Jewish synagogues, as well as government buildings and even the home of a union official and the home of a federal judge. Mm. That's all, pretty all ballsy. Yeah, very ballsy. And that sort of white supremacist playbook is seen as kind of a cover because he didn't want people to know that it was him. So he was kind of trying to frame the Buffalo guys. Uh, yeah, but also just keep the the eyes of investigators into these bombings off of the mob in general. Oh, okay. So at the time, police suspected anti-Vietnam protesters and other radical groups, so their investigation shifted away from the Rochester family entirely. Okay. This belief was strengthened by the fact that these bombings happened to coincide with several other bombings throughout the country and may have been a tactic on Valenti's part to avoid capture. Fortunately, no one died in these bombings. There was only one person who was injured. He really wasn't trying to maim anybody. He was trying to send a message. Was this the weathermen thing? The other bombings around the country? I think so. I mean, there was so much going on in the 70s. Bombings were crazy. People were freaking out about Vietnam. Mm -hmm. You know, protest was on the rise. Like, a lot of political and social shift was happening at that time. And this bombing seemed to have become kind of a popular way of, like, sending a message and getting in the press. Mm -hmm. And... I think that he chose this as an avenue because it was happening so much around the country and could be chalked up to other movements. And and yet 
the Buffalo faction like knew that he was trying to fuck with them, but mm-hmm. they're also not going to turn him in because then they're going to get investigated Looked themselves. Yep. So he's like trying to send a message that like, no, fuck you. I'm in charge. The Buffalo faction is over, but he's doing it in this grandiose way that investigators wouldn't necessarily be able to pick up on, but that like other members of the, of the Buffalo crime family would definitely know was for them. Okay. To show as a show of force, basically. Mm. Valenti's plan had succeeded and also let his enemies know how absolutely ruthless he was. His own Rochester family members, however, were not as keen on the bombings. In 1972, he was approached by both underboss Rusati and conciliere Picaretto, asking him to step down, accusing him of skimming profits and keeping them for himself. His underlings demanded he return the money and or abdicate power. However, Valenti refused. Angry at the request, he wanted to order a hit on Gingello, Rusati, and Picaretto. However, as protected members of the mafia, he had to get permission from the other families for this hit, and he was refused permission. So this makes the scene in the office where Kevin assembles the five families of, like, the office park to demand their parking spots back so much funnier now that I have this context. (laughs) It's like, I knew that was a mob reference, but I didn't make this connection. If you wanted, like, if higher-ups wanted to put hits out on other higher-ups, they had to have the support of other, like, the approval collegiate families. I think it had to be unanimous, too. Yeah, probably. So... That was interesting. But these three targets had heard of the plot against them and wanted revenge against Valenti. They were also refused permission to hit Valenti, but still wanted blood. So the trio murdered a man named Dominic Chirico, who we talked about. He was a loyal Valenti capo. He was killed by a shotgun blast on June 5th, 1972 in Rains Mm -hmm. Park in the city's Maplewood neighborhood outside of the home of his own girlfriend. So he's probably leaving the house. They had been watching him. Popped him right there. Chirico's slaying would prove to be devastating to Valenti because he was one of the most loyal captains in the family, serving as both a personal bodyguard and member of Valenti's, quote, special crew. So he was like a right-hand man. Okay. With his death, tensions inside the Valenti crime family were running high. Following the murder of uh, Chirico... A meeting took place between the top members of the mafia shortly before midnight on June 5th, 1972, where Frank Valenti agreed to retire to Arizona, where he had already been purchasing property. So basically in this meeting, it was like, dude, you're going to get murdered. Yeah. People want you to step down. It's time. And he's like, yeah, all right. okay, I'll go. But before he could slink away on December 15th, 1972, Valenti was convicted in an extortion case. Samuel Red Rusati became the new boss of the Rochester crime family with Sammy Gingello uh, becoming his underboss and Rene Picaretto retaining his position as family advisor. So all three of these people that Valenti had wanted to kill were now in charge of the Rochester crime family. And uh, now Valenti's in jail. Okay. And because Valenti had wanted these guys dead and now they're in charge, they ran any loyalists to Valenti out of the city. So it's like we're getting rid of anybody who would have allegiance to him because he wanted to fucking kill us. And now he's in jail. Yeah. You're Where under he new still leadership. he could kill you from. He probably could. But I think it was uh, when this like changing of the guard happens, there are a handful of people who might still be loyal to the one who's behind bars. But most people do fall in line under the new family because they don't want to fucking die. Mm-hmm. So it's Valenti didn't have enough pull anymore at this point. To really make anything happen. It Mm -hmm. was his time was over. We're just we're just in retribution mode at this point. Kind of get rid of the loyalists. Yep. We're starting fresh. So Valenti's out. Rosotti's in. And now we're in the Rosotti era. Okay. Aside from the slight reorganization mentioned above, Red basically continued business as usual. Long practice tactics continued with gambling at the helm, although the new group was fond of bid rigging, bribery, and extortion, aiming for more government construction contacts than they previously held. So they're diversifying their portfolio. Unlike the swaggering, flashy persona of his predecessor, Valenti, to the general public, Rosati, Red, portrayed a friendly and grandfatherly persona, often waving to police officers who were conducting surveillance on him and smiling for (laughs) photographs taken by the media. 
<laughs> this would prove to be the peak era of the Rochester crime family. It is estimated that roughly 45 men were made official members of the crew and hundreds, perhaps thousands of associates assisted in procedures. And now when you say associates, like that means every cop who looks the other way and is paid off mm -hmm. every uh, like construction company that understands and willingly participates in these sort of fraudulent extortionist government contracts like this encompass a lot of different people and yeah. organizations and companies that were essentially associates of the mob because they were doing work under mob rule even if they weren't out there in the streets killing each other they were still they're part of it you're still facilitating the mob activity yep. yeah because you're funneling money to them essentially mm-hmm Rusati's rule would not be would begin bloody, however, when in November 1973, authorities discovered the body of Vincent Jimmy the Hammer Massaro in the trunk mm. of his own car. Ew. Massaro was in there. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> Massaro was a foreman and construction equipment operator and suspected strong arm for the Rochester family mafia. So Vincent Massaro was an enforcer and a hitman who specialized in arson. Now, the arson specialization was not really for hits. Like, death hits. It was for... Uh, sorry, it was for insurance fraud. Oh, well, yeah. Arson yeah. would be a bad tactic for, like, killing people. Yes, yes, it would. So they were used mainly for collecting insurance money to fund mob activity. A friend of the Hammer, a man named Angelo Monacino, would testify that the mob received nearly a half million dollars in insurance payouts on eight separate fires. Ooh. He based the mob's success on these incredible three things. One, knowing, knowing how to <laughs> set fires. <laughs> I was joking. No. Nope. That's legit. <laughs> Two, having a high-ranking fire official in on the take. <laughs> and three, the lucky break that the arson detection squad of Rochester, New York, wasn't very good at detecting arson. <laughs> <laughs> so they made off with a lot of money doing this. Those are my three pillars of success. <laughs> yep, the three pillars of arson success. Know how to set a fire have someone on your payroll that is basically the fire chief and have a department that's not that good at their jobs. <laughs> Done. Freebie. Enjoy your half a million dollars in the 60s, which is like an unfathomable amount of money. Times eight. Yeah. <laughs> the night of his murder, Massaro received a call from this close friend turned hit organizer, Angelo Monashino, luring him to the garage of a construction company in Brighton. The construction company was owned by Monashino, which is why they chose that location. Monashino would later testify that when ordered by Picaretto to help murder Jimmy, who was his friend, he asked Rene Picaretto, why me? And Rene's response was, if you don't like it, you can go with him. So basically do this Ugh. or you're dead. Mm. Yeah, which is, that is, it's sad. Uh, that, I mean, I, I probably would just die and not kill you, but like I can't a hundred percent say what I would do if a mob boss was like oh, same. kill Lucy or you're you're dead. The probability of me killing you isn't zero. It's not zero, but it is low. It's low. I'd like to it's think low, it's low, but it's a non-zero mm -hmm. amount. You're telling I'm, me there's a chance. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad we're on the same page about this. Like I love you, but I also like my life. Yeah. yeah. Depends on how easily it would be to, like, flee. Like, if I could just leave. Right. And I'll maybe someone with... would kill you eventually, but yeah, as long I'm as it's not Yeah, I'm gonna die eventually. Yeah. So, honestly, I would be honored if you did it. Around I, five? <laughs> if, I, if I had to kill you, I would just take you to a nice field oh. and shoot you in the back of the head. Thank you. I'm never going to a field with you. <laughs> now i know just poison my mashed potatoes oh yeah i want to go set me up with a little dinner in bed mm -hmm. poison the shit out of it put on some of my favorite shows and just let me drift i that's would, a hit right there i would Tuck crush me up in put beans on my lap oh my god what a great I would, way to go i'd get you with a bunch of sleeping pills mm. and have you fall into a deep 
slumber and then a deep endless sleep probably get a bunch of your insulin and jab you with it and then you Done. can just yeah Easy go to sleep peasy. with a full belly and a kitty on your lap i'm so glad you've thought this through so thoroughly it just came to me yeah it's a moment wow. of inspiration it came to so easily hmm. <laughs> anyway that's not what uh Montesino did around 5 30 p.m how would you kill me how would I kill you? First of all, I would do like what you do for your dog on their last day before being euthanized. I would like take me to McDonald's. I would take you to McDonald's. I would let you order anything you wanted. I would take you to an oddity <laughs> shop and an antique mall, let you do all your little shopping. And then we would go back to somebody's house. And you always like to do your unboxing, even though I'm like with you when you buy all your stuff. I still want to mm -hmm. see all of your trinkets. Yeah. And uh, I'd either quickly <laughs> bludgeon you over the head and just put you out of your misery right in the middle of your unboxing unboxing or i too would choose the poison route whip mm -hmm. us up a nice little dinner put on like an old disney movie and just let you fall asleep and die that's so sweet it's a good day it's a good day the reason I'm i would shy away from bludgeoning is that i'm not convinced that i'm strong enough to make that a one hit and done like painless experience and i want it no. to be painless for you and I know myself, I would like hesitate mm -hmm. and then I wouldn't hit you as hard. You do hard. have a lot of obelisks, though, that I could use if I did it at your house. Oh, you could kill me with this. It's heavy. Yeah, that's a big boy. She's a big, she's a big boy. Right that to the temple. That sounds so nice. Well, it's a lovely day. Whether you do that on the day you kill me or just like my next birthday that we're together, let's just make that a nice day. Yeah, why don't we just carry out the ways we would kill each other without actually killing each other and treat yeah. each other to a really nice day <laughs> instead. <laughs> How about that? Will you let me lick some peanut butter off your finger? Oh my god. <laughs> like Callie got so many cookies and pup cups on her last <laughs> day on Earth. She was so happy. <laughs> oh, And then she got that pup like cups. little burst of energy where we took like a really nice walk and I was like is this a mistake? And then it it wasn't a mistake. I no, mean, it that wasn't dog a was mistake. not in good shape. But like, no, they always fucking do that. So you better not give me like one last great burst of energy right before I kill you. That'll be too <laughs> much for me. I'm just like really funny and wearing yes. like a really great You're outfit. You're on your absolute 100% <laughs> like best work. <laughs> just slaying the friendship game so hard all day. And then I have to fucking poison your pasta salad. It's for the best. It is for the best. It's 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 what it's what Picaretto forced me to do. It's not my fault. Exactly. Yep. All right. So around anyway. five thirty p.m., the <laughs> hammer was overheard on the phone yelling, "I'll straighten that son of a bitch out!" Before leaving with a loaded pistol, stating that he would be back in an hour. So Montesino must have been like, "Hey, like Picaretto's pissed at you. Come down here. We got to talk about this." Mm -hmm. And Jimmy's like, "Okay, well, I'll fucking figure this out." Guess his gun goes to meet him. By the time he arrived at the garage, he must have sensed something was wrong because he reached into his pocket and fumbled for his gun. But before he could draw his weapon, Jimmy the Hammer was shot. Oh. This is wild, too. So his close friends, Angelo Monachino, who had lured him to his shop, and Eugene DeFrancesco emptied a clip into his face. Oh, He was shot eight times in the face and neck, six times in the head. <sighs> and then they stuffed his body into the trunk of his own car. His body would be discovered just a few days later on November 28th, 1973. He was killed on November 23rd. Okay. One thing I would never do is shoot, shoot me in the six face. times in the face. Eight no. times in the face. That's too personal. Uh-uh. I... Your face is just gone. Gone. And I like my face. You want to look, look cute. I want to look good when I meet my maker. Yeah. Massaro was murdered for complaining about activities of the mafia's leadership to criminals outside of the family and taking jobs from other gangs. Mm. So he complained about how much money he was paid. He got about 700 bucks per arson job or like 5K a day or hit or whatever they had him doing. He was basically just a heavy for the mafia. Yeah. So taking outside jobs may have been related to like his need to just make money. Because he wasn't making very much doing this. When testifying, Monashino would state that he, Monashino, never complained about receiving $700 for the 11 fires he helped set for the mob. 
And when asked what would happen if he did complain, he replied, Jimmy complained and he was killed. He also clarified that you don't do it for the money as he was making at least 50 grand a year as president of his own construction business. Montesino was not Jimmy the hammer, mm. but you do it for the mob family. It ain't much, but it's all his work. <laughs> <laughs> this was the first major hit of Rusati's reign. It was probably used to show uh, as a show of force as a new dawn. Police would try to investigate, but nobody would talk because people were like, holy shit, he got fucking shot eight times in the face and shoved in the trunk of his own car. Like, by I'm not going to friends by his best friends. I'm not going to say shit about uh -uh. Rosati's fucking management. Absolutely like, I'm going to keep my not. goddamn mouth shut. <laughs> yes. However, by 1975, Rochester police had arrested several low level mob associates, one of whom was Angelo Montesino. As we know from his testimony, Maraschino would flip and become one of several government informants that would be placed in witness protection. Upon interviewing their informants, police learned the truth behind various gangland murders, unsolved arsons, and the Valenti era bombings, and of an alleged plot to assassinate Monroe County Sheriff William Lombard. These revelations, especially the latter, the, the potential assassination of a sheriff, angered law enforcement officials who now had a personal vendetta to take down the mafia. And when the police have a personal vendetta, work does not get done above board. Mm. So following the revelations of the bombings of the plot to kill the sheriff, police arrested the entire upper echelon of the Rochester crime family. So oh. the boss, Red Rusati, was arrested. Underboss, Sa Sammy G. Gangello was arrested. Rene Picaretto, Capo Thomas Murata. Soldier Eugene DeFrancesco, all of them are arrested and charged with the murder of Jimmy the Hammer Massaro. So the cops are using this murder as a way to just swoop in and arrest all these motherfuckers. Scorched earth. Yep. In addition to the leaders, middle tier mobsters were also arrested and charged with crimes stemming from the revelations of the government witnesses. Showing widespread local corruption, some of the arrested included union leader Samuel Campanella, Teamster Anthony Gangello, lawyer Samuel J. Digatano, De De and mm -hmm. Rochester Fire Chief Joseph Nalor, all of whom played various roles in these high profile crimes, basically just like letting them get away with insurance fraud and like defending them in court for bullshit things. You know, mm -hmm. people in unions that were higher up that were providing services. It was just, it's the, it's the facilitators. Shit. Yeah. The information provided by the cooperating witnesses was corroborated with extensive surveillance reports of the Monroe County Sheriff's department. The case against the mobsters was looking very strong. It was highly publicized and revealed the inner workings of the mafia in Rochester. However, uh, those uh, surveillance reports would prove not so ironclad. Oh, no. So and now it's November of 1976, and all of these arrests and the, the surveillance reports and the heavy-hitting investigation resulted in the conviction of almost all of these defendants. Rosati, Picaretto, Gangello, and three others received lengthy prison sentences that were handed down in January of 1977, and this was the first major success against the Rochester mob since Valenti's conviction and marked the first time anywhere in the nation that the leadership of an organized crime family were all convicted at the same time. So this was a huge fucking deal. Well, I sure hope you liked that clip. If you did like that clip, make sure you are subscribing to our YouTube channel, leaving us a nice review, and joining us on Patreon for even more video content, audio content, salacious content all around. Come join us. Treat yourself.